cleanse our head. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. A reading from the book of Genesis. These are the descendants of Isaac, Abraham's son. <clears throat> Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean of Padam Aram, sister of Laban, the Aramean. Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord granted his prayer and his wife Rebecca conceived. The children struggled together within her, and she said, If it is to be this way, why do I live? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples born of you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other, the elder shall serve the younger. When her time to, to give birth was at hand, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, all his body like a hairy mantle, so they named him Esau. Afterward, his brother came out with his hand gripping Esau's heel, so he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when he bore them. When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man, living in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he was fond of game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once when Jacob was cooking a stew, Esau came in from the field and he was famished. Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of that red stuff, for I am famished. Therefore he was called Edom. Jacob said, first sell me your birthright. Esau said, I am about to die. Of what use is a birthright to me? Jacob said, Swear to me first. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. The word of the Lord. 
Jesus, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and to deal with sin, he condemned sin in the flesh so that the just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit set their minds on the things of the spirit. To set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For this reason, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh. You are in the Spirit, since the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, Though the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through his spirit that dwells in you. The word of the Lord. Thorns grew up and choked them. 
Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let anyone with ears listen. Hear then the parable of the soul. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in the heart. This is what was sown on the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet such a person does not have no root, but endures only for a while, and when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, that person immediately falls away. As for what was sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the rule of wealth choke the word, and it yields nothing. But as for what has sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In, had no air conditioning. And sometimes on a hot summer night, even with the windows open and a fan running, it was almost impossible to exhaust all the hot air that had been built up during the day. Maybe some of you experienced the same thing growing up, or maybe you experience it now. And when it's hot, it's really hard to sleep. Well, during one of those hot summer nights in 1972, when I was 12 years old, I turned on a radio that my grandfather had given me. And I remember very distinctly laying in the dark, sweltering night and for the first time listening to Bob Euchre call a baseball game. We were playing the Minnesota Twins that night. Names like Roberto Pena and Skip Lockwood and Mike Hagen are all relegated to the annals of baseball trivia. But those night games, especially the late night West Coast games, listening to his voice helped to ease the relentless, hot, humid Wisconsin summer nights. And it laid a foundation for the love of baseball, which for me continues to this day. In fact, by one o'clock this afternoon, I will be firmly ensconced in my recliner, watching the Brewers play the Reds and hopefully pull ahead by a, another game to lead the National League Central standings. One facet of baseball that I find fascinating is how much statistics play into the game. Every aspect of the game is documented and plugged into spreadsheets and computer programs. The location of every pitch that a pitcher throws, every swing that a batter takes, and what kind of pitches he chased after, and how often does a batter strike out or pop out or get on base. Statistics determine the batting order the placements of the infield and the outfield. There is even a statistic that tracks the predictability of the mistakes in a game based on the air quality of the day. Of course, the granddaddy of all statistics is batting average, right? Ty Cobb, the greatest batter of all time, had a lifetime batting average of 377. 
He hit 37% of the times he stuck up to bait, he got up to bat. Ted Williams, 344. Right now, the Brewers team batting average is 231. And if we stop and think about it, the greatest player in the history of baseball only made onto base 30%, 37% of the time. And the average brewer only gets on base 23% of the time. In what other job or career could a person get a multi-million dollar contract for getting it right only 23% of the time? Well, the answer is easy. You and I do it every day. It's called being a Christian. In the gospel for today, in the gospel for today, Jesus lays out all the stats that we need to understand what we are called to do. Now, we've all heard this story. The sower laid out the seed, and some fell on the path, and some fell on the rocky ground, and some fell among the weeds, and some landed in the good soil and germinated and took root and yielded this bountiful harvest. And we like to think of ourselves, hmm, well, I know I'm not rocky soil, and I know I'm not in the weeds, and, well, sometimes on the path, but mostly I am the good soil. And we like to think of ourselves as the good soil. But the reality of it is, we're all of them. All through the course of our life, we vacillate between the path and the rocky ground and the weeds, and sometimes we do get it right. In Jesus' story, the planter was batting 250. Just slightly the better than the brewers who are in first place, right? In the story, Jesus seems to be saying that batting 250 is okay. Getting it right one out of four times is, is, is sort of acceptable. But I think that's kind of a lazy person's interpretation of the parable. A major league baseball, 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 baseball,
Well, again, the answer to being a great baseball player and being a great Christian is the same thing. Practice, visualization, do review, do review, do. Practice. Practice for Christians looks like what we're doing right now, right here in this room. Worship and fellowship. Christianity flourishes in a community of like-minded believers. When we get together, we are nourished by word and sacrament, and we're supported by a congregation of people who love us, who surround us. And when we are gathered together here among the people, we are among people who also want to be proficient in their lives as Christians. And we can support each other and buoy each other up. Practice also looks like daily prayer. Looks like reading scripture. Practice looks like the group of people from this congregation who gather online every weekday at 9 o'clock for morning prayer on Zoom. Practice looks like the Cathedral Institute or spiritual reading. Practice is those, are those things that form our spiritual lives before we have to call upon it to make moral and ethical decisions. Visualization. We need to think ahead of time what we're going to do when we're called upon to make tough decisions. We have to steal ourselves. We have to anticipate the pitfalls that might trip us up and avoid them. In the words of the nuns from Catholic grade school, we have to avoid the near occasion of sin. Stay out of the way of temptation. Anticipate what might come. Imagine what it looks like avoiding it, detouring it. That's what we do when we take a trip somewhere, right? We plug it into our garment, or some of us even still look at a map from time to time, and we imagine what the trip is going to look like. And if there's construction, if there are detours, we try to get around it as easily because we envision the trip before we even leave. Do, review, do. Also known as, don't be the coyote. When we do something and it fails, we're called to look at what failed and why. And then don't do it again. And that's called repentance. And God's response to our repentance is forgiveness. Far beyond God's forgiveness and God's grace that just so far outpace our ability to sin that it's sometimes beyond our comprehension. When we fail at something, very often, we just move on to the next thing. Without any self-examination, without any determination not to it again. And when we do that, we are destined to repeat the same mistake over and over and over. Just like the coyote. Remember the coyote and the roadrunner? When the coyote dropped that anvil off the cliff and missed the roadrunner, he just always moved on to the next thing. Jesus tells us, don't be the coyote. If that coyote would have changed on the second throw the trajectory of the anvil, or taken the wind into account, or maybe made that pile of bird seed down at the bottom of the canyon a little bit bigger, he would have gotten the roadrunner on the next try. Do, review, do. Fail, Repent, receive forgiveness, and then try again. That is what Jesus, I think, was talking about in the gospel for today. If you don't step up to the tee with the goal of hitting the thing perfectly, long drive, or if we, as a baseball player, don't step up to the plate without visualizing the fact that we could hit a home run, mediocrity, an eventual failure will come right after that. But when we step up and we think, I am capable of hitting a moral and ethical home run today. When I step up and think, you know what? 
I know I'm going into this circle of people and I'm going to hear some kind of ethnic thing or ethnic joke and I go in ready to say, I don't want to listen to that. When I drive up to the guy on the corner who's holding up a sign and I know he's going to be there, maybe we should just look him in the eye and nod and acknowledge the fact that that person is a human being. We need to visualize and we will fail and we get it wrong and then we have to do it all over again and get it right. <clears throat> so this week, as we go out into the world, one of our goals is not to be the coyote. Our goal is not to hope that we stand out and stay out of the sand trap or our goal is not to aspire to hit only one out of every four times. Our goal is to step up to the T with the idea that we're going to hit a hole in one. Our goal is to step up to the plate with our goal being to hit a home run. And we know that won't happen. But we also have to acknowledge that failure happens. And that falling short is a temporary setback, but it's not a life failure. Our goal is to understand that God wants us to try again and again and again as many times as it's needed until we get it right and we get the outcome that we desire. God does not expect us to get it right every time. God knows us. God knows our flaws and our weakness. And God also knows that we have the potential to be great. I really like the opening prayer, the opening call today for the day. It said, O oh Lord, mercifully receive the prayers of your people who call upon you, and grant that we may know and understand the things that we're supposed to do, and have the grace and power faithfully to accomplish them. God wants us to succeed. We all want each other to succeed. So I think our mantra as Christians is, we may not get it right, we may not be perfect, but when we are faithful, we can do what God calls us to do. of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered a death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. In our prayers today, we remember the church around the world 
We pray for Jeffrey, our bishop, and the standing committee of the diocese. We pray for de the dean, the chapter, the staff, and the trustees of the Cathedral Corporation. And the Anglican cycle of prayer, we remember the Anglican Church of Canada. Remember the people and clergy of St. John's Cathedral and the people and clergy of our companion diocese of Nawala in Tanzania. Remember all who suffer in body, mind, and spirit, including those in our prayer parish prayer list, Polly, Carol, Eric, Sharon, Maggie, Chris, Pat, Judy, Pam, Melissa, Gerald, Susan, Noel, Dan, John, Beverly, Kay, Mariana, John, George, Renata, Tali, Jeff, Jean, Phil, Jackie, Anne, Cheryl, Robert, and Samantha. We remember those who celebrate birthdays this week, including Karen Beaumont, Rosario Hardeman, Mary Hinderleiter, Molly Engel, and Dixie Stevens and those celebrating anniversaries, including Alec and Olivia Kopitsky and Fred and Mary Kings, and remember those who have died. Let us pray for the church and for the world. Grant, Almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, re reveal your glory in the world. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. guide the people of this land and all the nations in the ways of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation, that we may use its resources might rightly in the service of others, and to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless all those whose lives are closely, closely linked with ours, and grant that we may serve Christ in them, and love one another as he loves us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles, and bring them the joy of your salvation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We commend to your mercy all who have died, that your will for them may be fulfilled. And we pray that we may share with all your saints in your eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let's pray also for the whole human family. O oh God, who made us in your image and redeemed us through Jesus, your Son, look with compassion on the whole human family. Take away the arrogance and hatred which infects our hearts. Break down the walls that separate us. Unite us in bonds of love and work through our struggle and confusion to accomplish your purpose on earth, that in your good time all nations and races may serve you in harmony around your heavenly throne. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And let us confess our sins against God.
for the sidewalk. They come with stands. There's one in the back and um, they came early so I wasn't able to put it in the bulletin. But I have them. I'll be in the guild hall on the usual oval table. If you live in a neighborhood where people notice things like that, please take one and put it out. If you know somebody who has a business that's a little bit more prominent or if you live along Capitol Drive someplace where everybody goes by. So just come and take a, a sign. I have about 20. So. I'll be in the guild hall after during coffee hour. Thank you. And if you have books, oh, yes. bring them in. We're taking them in from basements falling. I'm sure it'll be another great sale this year. Brought in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God.
let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks to praise. It is right and good and a joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who in fulfillment of his true promise sent the Holy Spirit to come down upon us, lighting up on his disciples to teach them and to lead them into all truth, uniting people of many tongues in the confession of one faith, and giving to your church the power to serve you as a royal priesthood, and to preach the gospel to all nations. Therefore we praise you, join in our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn, claim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Please stand or kneel as you feel. Blessed are you, gracious God, creator of the universe and giver of life. You formed us in your own image and called us to dwell in your infinite love. You gave the world into our care that we might be your faithful stewards and show forth your bountiful grace. But we fail to honor your image in one another and in ourselves. We would not see your goodness in the world around us, and so we violated your creation abused one another, and rejected your love. Yet, you never cease to care for us and prepare the way of salvation for all people. Through Abraham and Sarah, you called us into covenant with you. You delivered us from slavery, sustained us in the wilderness, and raised up prophets to renew your promise of salvation. Then, in the fullness of time, you sent your eternal word made mortal flesh in Jesus. Born into the human family and born among us, he revealed your glory. Giving himself freely to death on the cross, he triumphed over evil, opening the way of freedom and life. The night before he died for us, our Savior Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. As supper was ending, Jesus took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant which is set for you and for all for the forgiveness of sin. Whenever you drink, do this for the remembrance. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Remembering his death and resurrection, we now present to you from your creation this bread and this wine. By your Holy Spirit, may they be for us the body and blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Grant that when you share these gifts, may be filled with the Holy Spirit and live as Christ's body in the world. Bring us into the everlasting heritage of your daughters and sons, that with Mary, the mother of our Lord, and all your saints, past, present, and yet to come, we may praise your name forever. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory and sorrow of Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, our Father,
Hallelujah. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us seek the peace. Hallelujah. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, grant us peace. The gifts of God for the people of God. Think that it remembers that Christ died for you and feed upon them in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Father, send us out in the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, the honor and the glory, now and forever. Amen. Go into the world in peace, be of good courage, hold fast to that which is good. Render unto no one evil for evil. Love the Lord your God, love your neighbor, and love yourself. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you this day and forever.